So moving on from drums, uh, what we've got for the rest of this session is based on, well, it is the mix session from this actual project. And we had uh, the periphery guys come out to my studio to mix this record. And with them here, uh, it was definitely a very kind of intense mix session. And I wasn't thinking so much about doing things in a truly like methodical way in terms of gain staging or minimal amount of plugins. So you might find from here on out things start to get quite heavy handed processing wise, or there might even be a bit of redundancy, but that's just the, the reality of a real life mixing session. So it's going to be quite fun to dive into this with you. You know, it's, it's going to be a bit of an unknown to me as well. Um, let's take a look at the bass. Now, one thing which I do know is that I printed down the bass tones that I used while I was tracking because they had a lot of plugins going on and I didn't want to be thinking about that. I was really happy with how it sounded um, in the context of my tracking sessions. Uh, I used two different bass sounds on this song. I've got a clean bass, which is in the verses, and then I have my kind of regular distorted bass sound. Uh, what I did a little bit differently this time around, I, I usually just have one channel for my bass sound, you know, it's full range, but this time I actually high passed the kind of amp sounds of my bass, so both the clean and the gritty sounding bass and then created an extra channel using the DI, um, which I've labeled as a sub channel. And the idea with that is to get a very clean and even sounding uh, note underneath everything to really bring out the sub frequencies. Not so much of an issue within this song, but certain other songs on the record had some really low tunings and I found this gave a very consistent low end that I enjoyed. So without nattering on too much, I'm gonna show you what the actual bass sound is like. I'm gonna show you the clean first. So that's a clean sound. I'm calling it clean. It's definitely got a bit of grit to it. It's quite a kind of, quite a zingy kind of bass sound. It's not a clean finger style warm thing at all, um, but it's nowhere near as distorted as what I'm about to show you. So let's break down a little bit of what's going on in those tones. So firstly, there's quite a lot of processing happening on the bass bus, uh, but there's no actual processing on the clean and grit kind of amp sounds. So as I mentioned, those have been printed out from my tracking session. But let's just check out what I'm doing as far as the sub channel goes. Um, this is what the DI sounds like on its own. So I'm low passing it in a very extreme fashion, 120 hertz, 48 dB per octave slope as well. And I'm also high passing it around 26 and a half hertz with a very steep slope again. And um, the reason for that is I just want to focus on kind of where the fundamental tones in my bass are um, and prevent it from getting too out of control because there's information that goes super low on the DI out of those, those Dingwall basses. And for one, I should say, just listening to that DI, I think it's apparent how much of the final tone is coming from the instrument because that's just that's just the raw DI from it, and it's got it's got that character um, right from the off, which is one of the reasons why I love them so much. So I've got uh, that extreme filtering going on, uh, a gain plugin that's doing nothing, as I mentioned. There might be a few redundant plugins here. Um, I'll show you what it sounds like just with that, that extreme low passing going on. I think you can see what I'm going for here. And then I'm using a very cool compressor called Power Air by uh, Sound Radix Power Air. I'm really using it for this leveler function it has rather than the compressor. But I'm not using the compression at all, but a bit similar to like those bass rider or vocal rider plugins that you can get. You can set a target um, volume and this plugin will keep your track at that level throughout um, as long as it doesn't dip beneath the, uh, the threshold. So. I'll show you what it's doing really. You'll see hopefully it's just pinning the, the level right at this minus 32.3 dB target level, which is what I thought worked best when I was doing the mixing. And that's a really cool thing to do because the different notes might have different volumes. You know, the instrument 
is going to have different resonances down there. So some notes might come through really strong and other ones a little bit less so. Um, even with the best basses in the world, that's going to be something. So uh, doing this means that the actual note stays exactly the same volume throughout. It's kind of the, the real icing on the cake of making this effect work well. So uh, without... So yeah, that's a really cool effect to make sure the note's coming through nice and strong at all times. Let's take a look at what's going on on the actual bass bus. So firstly, I've got a gain trim here. I'm taking 10 dB off the signal of the bass. So I'm going to bypass everything that comes after that. So you can get an idea of how much processing I'm shaping on this bass tone here. So next up in the chain I've got an EQ and I'm using this to boost a little bit of extra upper mid-range around 1k and then a bit of extra top at around 5.5k. I'm also notching out a couple of pesky frequencies that I was finding to um, yeah, just whistle a little bit too much I guess, that's typically why I do a move like this. And you know this notch that's a bit further down, this is going to be more of a kind of almost vocal sounding um, kind of odd resonance as opposed to like one of those whistly frequencies that you get as a result of the distortion. So. Um, it's not very big moves here, so it might not have the greatest effect. Let's let's see what it sounds like without them with again. It's a pretty minor difference there. I'd, I'd say um, it's always quite difficult to hear bizarrely, but but it's definitely bringing the the bass a bit more to the front when you hear it. It sounds a little bit recessed without those moves. Next up, I've got Fab Filter Pro Q2, and this looks crazy. <laughs> uh, let's see what's going on. So, lots of low end, a little bit of cutting around the kind of muddy 300 hertz area, loads of 700 hertz. So that's going to sound really kind of mid forwards. Um, a bit more notching going on, probably to reduce those ringing, whistly frequencies, and a bit more, yeah, four and a half k, quite heavy boost at the top end followed by a low pass filter. As I say, this probably all came through quite spur of the moment. In general, I'm not very afraid of sculpting bass tones quite a lot, and it might well be that a lot of these decisions were made um, kind of incrementally through the mix process. So it might have started out as quite a simple EQ curve that's ended up really complicated. Let's see what it sounds like without and then with again. Yeah, so that's adding a lot there, isn't it? That's, that's a really noticeable change. Next, I'm doing a bit of Pro MB. This is quite unusual for me. I, I typically might use just the low band to kind of pin that, that low note um, into place. Um, but here I've gone for a few different bands. Let's see what's going on once I hit play. Pretty cool, that's definitely kind of, yeah, pinning the note into place. It's bringing out a bit more of this kind of upper bass area, I guess you'd say. It seems to be centered around 120 hertz or so. So that's 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 quite cool, actually. Um, must have been something that got added somewhere down the line just to improve the quality of the, of the low end within the mix. I've got a bit of limiting going on to further ensure that the bass stays exactly in place. it looks like it's just getting the tiniest touch here and there. Um, so that's a really minor component in the bass tone. And then we've got more control going on. Or we would if it was doing anything. That's the, the joy of sessions like this. Uh, you know, as I say, it was a really intense mixing session and sometimes sessions settings get copied across from one song to the other and end up not doing very much, perhaps on one of the other songs there was a significant more amount of uh, you know, frequency information happening down here that this, that this multiband was dealing with. But it's all, all a bit of an exploration for us going through and trying to figure out what happened here. So that takes us from the kind of the tracks that came out of the tracking session to the final bass tone. Let's have a little listen to how the bass works with the drums, why don't we? So this, this is quite interesting. I always find that listening to bass and drums together gives you a really good idea of how 
how the bass is going to gel with the rest of the mix because the drums really do set the upper and lower limits um, in terms of top and bottom end and then you could really hear how much of the mid range of the bass is able to cut through the drums too so I'm going to start with none of these plugins on apart from the gain control the gain trim that is and then uh, gradually bring them in so you can hopefully hear the bass take on a lot more presence within the mix So interestingly, this, this Pro-Q2 is definitely doing the majority of the shaping of the, of the bass tone. And it sounds kind of overblown in context, but it's shocking sometimes how much top end and kind of gnarly mid-frequency you need to have in your bass for it to be able to cut through the mix well. So that's where we ended up for the P4 bass tone. So bass aside, let's take a look at the rhythm guitars. So for one, you can see these are all stereo files with just one side. Uh, active for each of them. This is how I was provided the, the stems from the band and the reason for this is that uh, Misha and the guys could decide exactly how much panning they wanted on each of these layers and it would get sent over to me exactly as they wanted. So these are the tones which they dialed in. Uh, I think they're actually really nice guitar tones and it was really easy to get them to work within the mix. It looks like there's a lot of plugins going on over here but I think once we actually delve into it we'll see there's not a huge amount of processing. The actual individual channels too don't feature anything. Something quite nice is because they were able to preset the panning, they also took the, the time to preset the kind of volume too, because especially on this kind of quad tracked bus here, uh, they've, they've printed them to me a little bit softer down in volume so that when I'm mixing, uh, I'm not chasing the balance that they had themselves when they were doing the mix. And you can see, for example, over here, it seems like the guitars get a bit louder, although that might just be the, the palm mutes. So let's take a listen to how the guitars sound with all the processing in place and then we'll gradually go through and, and uh, pick away at that. So you can see here I've actually grouped together even like these clean guitars that you hear in the verse 2 section. Uh, they're all going through the same kind of cab sound. And I think that's a really crucial point to make is that the cab really defines the global EQ of your guitar tone. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's the most important thing, but it has, to be, it has to be right. If the cab is right, then you can generally change around the amp, the guitar, the pedals you use with quite a lot of freedom. Um, because the cab is delivering the right kind of frequency range to make sure it cuts through in the mix. So for that reason, a lot of the EQ work that I do on guitars is much more related to the kind of EQ curve that that cab is giving, more so than the amp or the guitars. And for that reason, it's really not an issue for me to group together, for example, the clean guitars um, with these more gainy guitars in the mix. I've gone and bypassed everything apart from the gain plugins because those are really what's setting the level of the guitars, clearly. I had to pull down the level quite a lot, minus 13 dB from the raw guitar tone. But then I found myself actually adding 4 dB back on at the end of the chain um, to get the right level in the mix. You can see actually, yeah, just looking at the automation, it, it looks like I was actually just aiming to get the rhythm guitar faded to sit at zero most of the time. Um, you can see like for most of the intro section and the kind of um, pre-chorus and all this stuff, it's kind of sitting around zero. So let's dive into the actual processing. The first thing which I've got going on is a notch at 2400 hertz. This will be like a kind of whistly frequency that I heard in the guitar so we can hear without it. It's quite a subtle one. Um, but it's there nonetheless, and having it there definitely smooths the guitar response a little bit. 
Uh, next, after the game plugin, we've got um, a bit of multiband control for the low, the, the kind of low end of the chugs of the guitars. Uh, this is really crucial, especially for bits over here, where when you palm it your guitar, there's just so much extra low end coming off the strings. Um, it's good to have this kind of, as a kind of dynamic EQ uh, instead of reaching for a static EQ and cutting away the body of the guitars for the rest of the song, even when they're not palm muting. So this is a trick that's used so much in rock and metal. Um, nothing particularly special about it, but I'll show you what it sounds like on this chugging section without and then with. And hopefully we'll find if we go to a section that doesn't have chugging that it's not really doing anything. It's doing something, but very dynamically, so it's definitely not cutting low end, especially on the, the kind of higher figures that the guitarists are playing. It would start to sound really thin if I was taking out those frequencies for the static EQ. So that's a trick which, which I use all the time. Next comes the overall EQ that we've applied to the guitars. You can see low pass, about 9K, high pass at 62. So that's not doing very much, but I have kind of used a bit of resonant high pass to boost a bit of extra low end in there. Um, cutting away a little bit of low mids around 300, boosting a little bit of 1k, cutting a little bit of 3.5, boosting a little bit of 6. So these are all relatively small moves. I mean, like these are 1 point something dB. This one here at 3.5 dB is by far the biggest move that we're doing on guitars. But um, these kinds of moves are really specific to the source tone, um, but they're, they're kind of crucial in making sure that the guitars have, well, the most important frequency of the guitars are audible in the rest of the mix. So. I'll show you what this sounds like without and then with, and maybe we'll investigate what each of these moves is doing individually. So yeah, that, that kind of EQ curve is definitely clearing things a lot, up a lot. I mean, that, that 300 hertz-ish uh, scoop is doing a lot to reduce any boxiness in the guitars. It's a really nice raw tone, but for, in order for it to fit into the mix well, it's kind of necessary to be able to trim some of that away. So very little to go now. We've just got a tiny bit of stereo widening using S1, 1.12 on the fader there. Just a tiny bit there to open up the middle of the mix a little bit. And then finally, we've got uh, one more EQ over here. Uh, we've got a notch around 2.5k and then uh, a, a cut but with a fairly narrow cue around 3.5k. So this is all just to reduce harshness in the guitars. Um, I don't know what stage these were added, but clearly we found that within the context of the mix there's a little bit too much um, kind of strident stuff happening up there. So I'll show you without and then with and then I'll, I'll turn these into boosts so you can hear them quite clearly. It's subtle, but it definitely does something to kind of add an extra level of polish to these guitars and make them sound kind of finished for the mix. Now, as ever with Periphery, there's a lot of uh, lead guitar layers going on. You know, you've got these kind of typical post-rock lead guitars. Um, that's where you've got a delay in front of the amp so that it sounds really kind of uh, garbled and, and saturated. got, um, what's this? So that's for the section which is here labelled as cop drama. Um, I think it's quite obvious why. Sonically, definitely sounds like that kind of thing, doesn't it? Uh, what else have we got layer-wise? super heavy ambience on some of these guitars. And towards the end, it feels like we've got a lot of extra stuff coming in. Let's take a listen to that. So 
So, I mean, I think that that's beyond the end of the song. That's kind of the transition into the next song. But you can hear there's a lot of really pretty uh, clean guitar stuff going on in this track too. So I've probably treated these uh, quite individually. Uh, let's have a little look at what's going on. So post-rock lead, um, it's obviously come in ready with a lot of low end cut because it doesn't sound like it's got much low end to it at all and I'm not cutting any, so. It's a mono guitar, I think, but I saw fit during the mix process to apply a mid only cut to the low mid range, doesn't matter. Uh, it's gonna be doing something to declutter there and then cut a little bit of the harshness and low pass it just so it's not gonna sound too bad in the mix. Those kinds of guitars could sound really harsh and fatiguing if you're not careful. Um, I'm just going to go through these quite quickly. So you can see on this guitar here, I just saw fit to notch a couple of frequencies, but nothing else was required. Interestingly, very different tones being used on the same channel there, but they've been engineered well enough that there's really no corrective EQ needed. And None of these clean guitars that you hear towards the end of the song have any kind of processing on them. They're just going to this layer guitar bus with um, a clip gain down of 9 dB so that they sit into the mix nicely. Then finally with guitars, we get to the guitar solo. This one's got a little bit more going on in it. This one was clearly done with a split coil setting because it's got quite a lot of, kind of harsh whistly frequencies going on, which would be typical if you're using like a coil split on your guitar. So I actually use this Soothe plugin on the the tone in order to reduce that so that's quite interesting now uh, let's take a listen to what that's doing so that's really softening the attack of that that's probably quite a good call because the the core tone's pretty harsh Something that's kind of interesting is that this guitar has been provided with no cab sim active and I guess that was because I wanted a bit of extra control so Misha kindly provided it. Uh, as I was mentioning before the cab does so much for the um, for the general EQ of a guitar and it's quite nice especially with leads to have a bit of extra control over that. So this is what it sounds like with no cab I and mean, it's a horrendous sound. Uh, you definitely wouldn't want to listen to this for long. I'm actually using a plugin which this is just a prototype but You'll hear more about this uh, in the near future from GGD. Um, this is a cab uh, plugin that we've developed using Zilla cabs. Um, I love how it sounds. I'm using one of my favorite sounding cabs here um, in order to turn this into what should sound more like a guitar. So this is what it sounds like with that cab sim active. It's a quite a grand old difference there. So EQ wise, I've definitely gone a bit more aggressive on the high and low pass than on the rhythm guitars. Um, but I think one of the most important things is I've been cutting quite a lot of mid range here. And that will be probably related to the fact it's not the bridge pickup, which sounds like an odd thing to say, but when I'm tracking guitars, I use the bridge pickup almost entirely because um, it just sits in the mix that much better for me, especially if you're trying to put a lead on top of rhythm guitars that are tracked with the bridge pickup. So here they've gone for like a middle position split coil thing. And I've seen fit to reduce a little bit of the mid range here. Some of that might also just be to fit it into the mix without having too much excessive um, kind of low mid frequencies going on. Um, but for sure, this will also be partly to do with the use in the middle pickup. Uh, I'm also shelving off the top end around 2.2K by minus 3 dB. Um, and that's to, yeah, to soften up these guitars a bit. And there's some fairly major cuts going on here to reduce the harshness. Let's see what this sounds like without and then with the EQ. So it sounds quite odd in isolation, but we haven't quite finished yet. So the next step is, I think, some quite heavy compression. Um, I don't always compress lead guitars, but I do quite like to do it from time to time. And here, because of the amount of harsh stuff that's going on in that upper mid range, um, I'm emphasizing that in the side chain of the, of the compressor so that the compressor is particularly aggressive towards those frequencies. So let's see what happens once we have this engaged. So that's giving a bit more of a fluid feel to the solo. It's also making it quite a lot louder, so 
Um, apologies for that. And then finally, we've got a bit of delay to add some ambience. I'm using here this repeater plugin. I really like how it sounds. I don't, don't always use it, but um, when it's right, it's really right. Here I'm using it just in its initial digital delay setting, but I'm rolling off quite a lot of high end and high end and low end. Um, so it's quite a dark sounding kind of bed for the solo to, to live in. One of the things I really like is the use of this spread control that makes the, the delays really stereo without becoming ping pong. So I'll show you what that sounds like without and then with. Have it that's the guitar solo processing okay so not far to go now with this mix um, there's a, quite a few little interesting things going on in terms of the orchestration i'm just going to solo the actual the bus for all of these uh, synth tracks here so you can get an idea i'll just click around so that you can hear some of the sounds that are being used obviously we'll start with the with the intro which you can hear in isolation very aptly named saxophone. So let's just dive in and check out some of these sounds and how I've processed them. Yeah, this is exploration for, for all of us. Uh, one thing is on the synth bus, I am using this trick, which I talked about in the previous masterclass too, which is to do a huge cut, but only on the mid part of the spectrum. So it leaves the stereo sides intact, um, but it cuts a lot of that muddy stuff that would make it much more difficult for the snare to cut through, the vocal to cut through, the bass drum, bass guitar as well. Um, by doing this, you instantly get a much wider image. In fact, I'll just, so I'm going to choose a certain portion of this song and you could be able to hear uh, the effect that it has on the stereo imaging, especially. So it instantly pushes things way out to the sides. Apart from that, the only thing I'm doing is cutting a bit of gain on the synth bus and I guess notching a certain frequency, I'm not sure where that was coming from, but at some point that seemed to be necessary. Um, so there's actually no processing on this first synth here. A little bit of processing here on this sub 37 audio, whichever that is. So I guess it's a synth being treated like a guitar. It's, it's being sent through the axe effects with processing like, like the lead guitars would have. I've gone and done another big mid scoop um, just on the mid band here. So that's mid band cut on top of mid band cut, uh, but it seems to work quite well. Sub drops haven't got anything on them. The impacts haven't got anything. What's going on down here? Oh, yep, here we go. More of the mid cut trick. So obviously it was going quite extreme on that in this session plus a bit of cutting of extra mid-range. Let's see what that sounds like without. So you can hear how big an effect these EQ moves are having on just cleaning up those, um, those kinds of sounds in this mix. What have we got down here on the intro? The intro's got another one of those mid-cuts. <laughs> I was on a roll. Um, more of the same. Go. Piano. So a mid cut, but not just in the mid band this time. It's quite interesting. So I remember there was some interesting automation. Oh, that's on the ambient piano down here. So you can see I've actually, instead of going too heavy on the compression on this part, although I have done some compression, looks like I've actually automated um, 
some volume moves just to make this sit well into the mix. Let's see what that sounds like. Interesting. So that seems to be um, really taming, especially that that one um, that one hit right here. Interesting. So that's doing quite a lot to kind of make sure that that line is still audible without resorting to super heavy compression. Although there's definitely a fair amount of compression going on. Let's see. Oh, a bit more mid cut, but nothing on the mid band this time, just general cleaning up. It's a very dark piano sound, but I think it's intended to be that way. Nothing on the roads, nothing on the scrangs. What are the scrangs? So, you know, a lot of this is just because Misha does such a great job of choosing these sounds and adding all these production elements to the songs. He's, he's clearly chosen sounds that work really well in context and they're just not really needed very much to make them work. And what we've got here, I think it's a little double of a vocal line maybe. Just a little double of that vocal. And then of course there's the saxophone, which didn't need any processing. So you know, as far as synths goes, it was quite quite an easy job. A lot of that mid-cut technique, especially on the mid-band, which has helped to give things um, extra clarity for sure. That's obviously something which I've carried across the whole album too. One part of the mix that seems to have taken a lot of processing to get right is the live string section. Uh, it's quite a small little ensemble and we definitely wanted it to sound a lot bigger than, than the actual number of players that were there. So this is what it sounds like uh, just with the gain plugin to keep the, the level in control. It's really nicely played. So um, I've used this Soothe plugin again to, to reduce some of those, those real harsh frequencies you can hear coming from the, the bows. Weirdly, that almost immediately gives the impression of there being a few more players than there actually are. It's, it kind of sounds like we, we doubled the number of players just by doing that. Um, I'm using a multi-band to control a few different frequency ranges. I guess you know, it's really important that all of the different resonant notes which are coming off those violins are controlled so that once you level them in the mix, you can hear the notes of the strings really well without certain bits jumping out and grabbing you by ear. So. doing a good job with that. Next up, of course, is a big old reverb. Um, I absolutely love this, this reverb by East West, Quantum Leap Spaces. And um, it's quite CPU heavy. I tend to only use it once or twice in a mix, um, but this was clearly the time for that. This is what it sounds like. beautiful verb. Here I'm using, I guess I'm using the same leveler trick that I was using on the bass uh, from this power compression to, to really pin them in volume. So It's interesting because it's after the reverb but seemed to work in the mix. Um, and then finally I've low passed, uh, again this must be a decision to make it work within the context a little bit better. There can definitely be a lot of very high airy frequencies coming off the string, so this is obviously to reduce that. Let's see what that sounds like. So that seems to give it a bit of an old timey vibe almost, that, that low pass filter, but I'm into it. As with every other periphery record that I've worked on, Spencer took care of his own vocal engineering and 
he did a lot of creative effect stuff on his on his own vocals, so it made sense for him to provide me with kind of printed down stems in order that we don't have to just waste a lot of time recreating the effects that he's already done. So it looks like for the most part we've got a single lead vocal with a few harmonies and doubles coming in on the pre-choruses and choruses. So um, you know, we've got a main vocal which sounds like this. We know sharp things and they chew in the time alone. We've all got those things crawling under what they perceive. We know sharp. So I've used quite a lot of EQ here, it seems, but I haven't had to do any extra compression. As you can see, the vocals he's provided with me are pretty well sausaged already. So um, these moves here seem to be mainly cutting kind of harshness, I guess, or boxy mids and, and harshness, and also adding a little bit of extra body at the same time as high passing. So this is what that sounds like. Things crawling under what they perceive. We know sharp things and they chew in the time alone. Next up, we're using the Pro MB. This is actually quite a similar looking trick to what we do on palm mutes on guitars. I guess the idea is when a vocalist is singing really soft, you tend to get a lot more low end resonance in their voice and the, the louder they sing, the more upper mid range and top you get. So being able to dynamically control the amount of, of lower mid range and upper bass on the, on the singer's voice is really useful because just like with the guitars, if you end up using a static cut for that, it could mean that when they move into certain ranges of their voice, it sounds really thin as a result. So here I'm using that just to trim um, the lower end of his voice, uh, but in a kind of dynamic way. Next, we've got some further EQ, and this is to cut more harshness, I guess. And I mean, all these moves would have been very much on the fly. Let's see what this sounds like. All of my life, but no matter the things I do, never get over it. A stack of pie from a place so far on my door. The truth, cause... So that's doing, it's definitely doing something to kind of reduce how strident his voice is sounding, but this boost here is also giving us back a little bit of presence too. It's not all cut. Um, next we're using this Soothe plugin that's uh, definitely gonna take a little bit of the edge off that vocal, so let's see what that's doing. All of my life, but no matter the things I do, never get over it. A stack of pie from a place so far on my door, the truth cut. And that's really welcome, especially with the amount of compression that he's putting onto his voice. You know, this Soothe plugin is, is immediately raining back in some of those really kind of harsh whistly frequencies that you can hear in his voice are being exaggerated by the amount of compression and saturation they're going through. Rounding out the processing on the vocal, uh, I've got a couple of different EQs and it actually looks like they're both just these notches in the kind of vowel area of his voice. Uh, again, the really heavy compression will have brought out those tones on certain, certain notes as he hits them. So as I've been going through, I've been notching these out and actually doing five cuts here, clustered together around there plus another two here, so I wonder if we're gonna hear that if I, if I hit play. All of my life, but no matter the things I do, never get over it. A stack of pie from a place so far on my door, the truth. Cause what's been nothing to fleeting youth. Ultimately, it's a really great sounding vocal that's been you know, pre-processed a lot to sound super compressed and upfront, so. So it was really just about kind of notching out the nasty stuff and making sure that his really powerful voice doesn't come across as kind of harsh in the mix. I've carried that same processing over to some more of these harmonies. It seems like there's just kind of different variations of similar treatments going on on a lot of these stereo tracks here. Uh, then we've got a general ambience track, which was kind of printed reverb and delay that, that Spence was using when he was monitoring his own vocals which I'm just layering in underneath his, uh, his voice so that we get the ambience there. On the actual vocal bus, I am doing a little bit of high and low pass, it seems, as well as bringing out this multiband again. Oh well, that's actually quite extreme. So uh, this must be just kind of keeping track of most of the key areas of the vocal sound and just keeping them really, really pinned so they don't get out of balance. I think with vocals, probably the hardest thing is just making sure that they sound consistent through a song, through all the different ranges that a vocalist is using and 
for that reason, I think that multi-band tools um, or dynamic EQs are really crucial. Let's see what that's adding. The tools are on repeat, you're not the feeling me. It's on my chest and you're in this eye. Get away, get away from the sights and sounds. Keep it on the ground. I don't that's pretty cool. I mean, it's all cut, really, and it's just um, it's removing the harsh stuff, kind of the, the almost radio-ish sounding frequencies, um, and then kind of more boxy mid-range stuff that's happening as and when is necessary. So that's pretty cool, and I've just got that sitting there on the on the output. This gain, oh, I know, that's that's from when I printed the vocal up versions of the song for the, um, for the final delivery of the songs. I did another print with the vocals, 1 dB louder, but what we're listening to now would be the actual album version. Now let's take a look here. Looks like there's a kind of cool vocal effect going on. This is true, and I'll be missing you. So that seems to be some kind of effect that we created on the fly with some heavy distortion, quite heavy band passing into a kind of roomy verb. So what does that sound like? Be missing you. Right, so that's super subtle. But then I've thrown that into just the cavernous sounding black hole plug in by um by Even Tide. And I'm just looking at the plugin I can see that we've actually automated the mix up as that part goes on. So we're almost at the end there, um, but there's also a little bit of choir going on. I'm doing individual processing again, looks like I'm multi-banding stuff to keep the mid-range in check, high passing, and then I'm doing some quite heavy compression. And with this being a kind of stereo um, recording with different voices, it's really important I've kept the stereo link off on this compressor, just so that the two sides are free to compress independently. And you don't get that weird pumping effect where slight timing mismatches between the left and right causing this kind of unstable image. So um, let's just take a little listen to one of these, these choir tracks. Death is true and I'll be missing you. Death is true and I'll be missing you. So yeah, it's kind of a blend of the close mics, the harmony pass, and then a kind of room track too. But it feels like it's mainly reliant on the close um, and I am, of course, throwing some verb onto this too, but it's, it looks like I'm just, yeah, the only bit that's getting the verb is the close mic there, so. And the verb is courtesy of FabFilters Pro R, it seems, which is a really great sounding reverb that obviously, in the moment, we found to work particularly well for this. So that's basically everything that's going on in the mix. I mean, just looking at it, you can see that a lot of what's going on um, Mix-wise, there's also a lot of automation across the buses and the individual channels. And I think that's where the life of a mix really tends to be found. So it's definitely worth not thinking of your, your mixes as these really static entities that it's all about setting up the tones and then just leaving them static through a mix. It's definitely worth thinking about doing things like I don't know, ducking guitar volumes when extra layers come in on top of them or um, just... One thing I quite liked actually about doing the bass amp separate from the subtrack was the ability to boost up the kind of gritty portion of the bass signal without affecting the amount of low end in the mix. That was quite quite cool. Um, what else is going on here? Yeah, just fine tuning the, the levels of these synths and especially vocally, it looks like we've kind of gone through some of these phrases even just to make sure that they're right. Um, you see, it's quite a lot actually to ride the vocals through the song. I think perhaps just to round things out, it'd be cool to take a look at what I've been doing in terms of this um, compression on the master bus. Now, I've spoken a lot about the, um, the SSL style compression that I do. I'm not gonna go over that again, but this, this FG Red was just particularly interesting. So let's find a little bit where we can, um, we can hear what that's doing. I'm gonna start with this off and put it back on again.
So hopefully you can hear, just switching this on and off, how much extra excitement that you get with it on. Um, it's obviously quite an extreme kind of pumpy effect, but one thing you should definitely be wary of if you're trying to replicate this is not to push the threshold too far, because you've still got to allow the compressor to recover in time. If I push the threshold further, it's not actually going to sound more compressed, it's just going to be quieter, because the needle's never going to make it all the way back to zero. So definitely fine-tune that threshold control to get the, the best effect with minimal amount of time um, spent not getting back to zero, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to play this song in its entirety.
cool, so thanks for bearing with me. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and that you found some useful tips in there. Uh, head over to getgooddrums.com if you want to find out some more information about the new Matt Halpern Periphery 4 Signature Drum Library. And also keep an eye out on this YouTube channel for loads more tutorials and general content.